Hi everyone, it's Plus GP coming in from Melbourne, Australia. And let me tell you, I've got a fantastic celebrity coming in from the US. It's Ellen Bree. How are you today, Ellen? Hi, I'm great. Good to talk to you finally. Well, I just want to say, being an actress and also a stunt woman, you've done so many things in your career and being on fantastic shows like St. Elsewhere, MacGyver, you know, and having roles in Star Trek, The Next Generation. I mean, these are really great shows, Murder, She Wrote. And most of these shows were huge here in Australia. When you look back on your career, just tell me what it was like doing all these parts. It was a dream come true. I'd wanted, I've always wanted to be an actress ever since I was a little girl. So I was living out a dream. It was magical. Still is magical when I get to work, although... It's harder to work when you're older. Ageism is alive and well. There aren't as many parts. But um, now I had a good ride and I'm very grateful. Uh, talent is one thing, but talent without luck uh, and without the fortitude to go through the ups and downs. And there are plenty of ups, but there are plenty of downs and rejection. Without having that kind of fortitude and luck, doesn't matter if you're talented. In fact, a lot of acting coaches I worked with, it was like, you know, the most talented people are usually doing scene study and acting class and, and can never get arrested. You know, they, uh, it's got, luck has something to do with it. And, um, you know, not giving up, having that drive. I got it. But doing these series, can I ask, with all your fans out there, who do they? What character do they really identify you with the most? Oh, that would have to be Shirley Daniels from Saint Elsewhere. I mean, she was quite the character. I I loved that show. I loved working on it, and and I had great storyline. You know, and she was like a nurse turned vigilante. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, and uh, you know, she had relationships. She had relationships with uh, the character, Ed Begley's char Ed Begley Jr.'s character, Howie Mandel's character, Fiscus. Um, so I, I just had a lot of fun. Also, we had people, series regulars on that show, like Howie, like Ed Begley, who were so funny. I mean, it was just, it was so much fun going to work every day. And, and the writing was phenomenal. So as an actor, Everyone who was on that show really loved working on it because they gave us such juicy material. I also got to ask, meeting fans and signing photos and things like that, that gives a lot of people, you know, happiness and a buzz. And I'm just saying, coming across all these fans, what sort of questions do they ask you? Um, oh, you mean specifically about that show or just in general? Any show, any show. Basically, what do they tell you when they meet you? Do they tell you how great you are and they tell you, I see you on TV on this show or this character and I yeah. identify with it? Well, when when they're truly fans, yes, they're uh, almost all of them are absolutely lovely, excited to, to meet me or whoever the star is they're meeting and um, very respectful and, and just excited. But the, the incredible thing about the fans are they remember more than I do. They remember more than we do. I recently did one of those signing conventions where it's called the Mid-Atlantic Signing, the Mid-Atlantic Nostalgia Convention. And it was a lot of uh, series regulars from TV shows as well as feature films from like maybe the 80s, the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, you know, 2000s. And the fans would come up so excited and want your autograph and to talk to you. But they remembered more than I do. In fact, what's funny is, um, you know, you'd be signing it and, uh, I, you know, I'd say, so how do you want me to sign it, whatever it the what I was signing, whether it was one of my photos or some piece of memorabilia or a poster they brought, and they'd always go, "Well, sign it this way and and sign your character's name." And I was like, 
ah, like, hurry up. I mean, obviously, I know Shirley Daniels. I played that part for years. But, like, if it's a one-off, like Murder, She Wrote or something, where I did one guest star, it's like I'm going on IBD going, oh, my God, what's the name of that character? You know, and then I get the character name and, uh, you know, it's funny, but they know they know so much. They can tell you about yourself more than than you remember. I got to say, in 1978 and 79, being on The Amazing Spider-Man and also being on MacGyver, because MacGyver was huge here, those TV shows have got their own fans and following like Star Trek, right? And I they mean, these sure people do. come out and like they're, they're nutso for the shows. They live the they shows. Are, they are nutso for the shows. <laughs> um, I love doing uh, uh, Spider-Man. And in fact, you know, I'm sure Nick Hammond lives in uh, Australia and has lived there for many decades. I know Australia's great. You should come out to Australia. You'd well, love it. Guess what? Guess what? You're coming. I've been there twice already. <laughs> there aren't that many people you interview in the U.S. who say that, I bet. I've been there twice. And guess what? I was there this year. I just got back. Uh, I got back a couple of months ago. And the reason, I mean, it's a little off the topic, but it's, um, I was in Australia because I'd, um, I'd always wanted to go to Oceania, go to Australia, New Zealand, then pop up to Bali. I'd always wanted to do this. And so finally, after many years, planned a trip, left the U.S. February of 2020. And guess what? I was supposed to be gone for three and a half months, going slowly everywhere. I had to race back and cancel m more than half the trip to get back before the world shut down. Um, I went out mid-February. I had to fly back. I couldn't even get a flight. I was in Sydney, waylaid for about a week and a half. Finally got like one of the last flights out on March 31st, 2020. And so... And that didn't, didn't even bring me back to L.A. It flew me to San Francisco, which going through that airport was weird, like huge airport. No one there. You could hear a coin drop. Um, and then I was just determined after the whole trip being basically blown away uh, that that was the first place I was going to go when I did a long trip. So um, my uh, husband and I just got back several months ago and we have done australia it's great did you also, come to melbourne oh absolutely as a matter of fact i we we managed to get to melbourne the first time around and and then it started shutting down but uh loved melbourne loved loved going out the great ocean road yeah that's right yeah and then we we slowly went around we went to the outback that was an experience. Uh, I'm not going to say anymore. It's it's different than the rest of the country. Let me just say that. So then we uh, we actually spent a lot more time this time around since we had the time and drove slowly all the way up the coast, all the way up to um, Port Douglas yep. and did a lot of scuba diving, went out to Heron Island. Fabulous. That's fantastic. It's good that you yeah. experienced and explored Australia. i got to say, a lot of people live around the coast, of course, right, near the water. A lot right. of people love the water. So no matter where you live, if you live in Melbourne, as you said, you go the Great Ocean Road, you go to Fairhaven, that's a surf beach. I'm just saying there's Apollo right. Bay, there's Lawn, as you know. And then if you want to go mountains and wineries, you go the Yarra Valley, which is about – 35 minutes out from Melbourne, right, where the mountains meet the grapes, and you can sit there at Chandon, right, which is a French uh, winery, drink wine, whatever. And it's just amazing where these different areas are because, as I said, we work off the temperature. Like today, it's 30 degrees. It's a very hot day. Oh, you know? yeah. And people go and swim and surf. That's what they do. It's only now it started because it's been so cold. Well, swimming and surfing, you're lucky you can do it where you are because, honestly, up in the north, 
there's some places it's like people are, it's crazy to me. They're taking beach vacations and they can't go in the water because of the crocodiles. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, I was going to say the nice. crocodiles can take you into the water. Oh, it's, my God. It's like unbelievable. Yeah. There's, I've got to explain something about Australia. Ah. There's a lot of dangers, right? Hidden dangers. I'll give you an example. People come holiday here and they see water. And they don't know that there's rips there that can take you out in the ocean and it's oh, yeah. dangerous. Unless you go swimming where the beach is patrolled by people, you don't know. Just looking by yourself, a lot of people come in, they just go in the water and they drown. And then someone will go to try and save them and they'll drown too because we've got natural dangers like snakes, things like that that people are not aware. They're not aware of this stuff. And you just always got to be careful. That's that's basically oh, yeah. it. Oh, my God. You have you have more poisonous snakes than any yeah, other. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. It's crazy. It's I mean, crazy. that's why you just got to take it easy and don't rush. If you want to see animals go to the sanctuaries, go where it's sort of like controlled. You just can't get in a car and go anywhere because you can become isolated and you know you don't know where you've gone. You know what I mean? Right. You just need a flat tire, no one's gonna find you. It's like no, it's no that kind of country. <laughs> the people are great. I had a great time. I, I really did. I know. I gotta say the wine and the food is just like here is amazing. It's like so multicultural. We've got people here that have restaurants here in Melbourne that have gone to Italy and won worldwide awards for making pizza. So you don't have yeah. to go to Italy. Then you've got, you know, like I like Italian food and my parents were Greek background. Everything is here. You can go to the Crown Casino and go and have a great pizza. You can go to Carlton, Ligon Street, and there's pizza places there, pasta places. It's like we've got the best food like Sydney. It's like it's so multicultural. You can have anything you want to eat. It's just amazing Absolutely. place. Absolutely. You know, there are a lot of people in the U.S. and probably in Australia, too, that never really get out and explore the whole country. I I love to travel. So I've, I've been to what well, my son keeps track. I've been to 46 out of 50 states. So I'm uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, so I love to travel. But there are people who hardly, you know, move around. And Australia is such a varied country. I mean, there's so many different places and they're not all like each other. It's really important to go out and explore and, yeah. uh, you know, travel. To, it's a vast to, country. Park. That's what it is. It's like unlimited. You can go in your car and keep driving and not stop. You know, it's that, that's right. how it is. I mean, the way I see the country now, it's like, People want to entertain themselves. And I've got to understand, with the beach culture here, 1963, 64, your beach movies, right, influenced us a lot here because we had the kind of sound and dance called the stomp until we saw those beach movies with Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon. We had to find our, our identity. And through those beach movies, then we started. Like surfing was big in the 50s, into the 50s and in the 60s, and you got – the greatest surf beaches here in Melbourne, like uh, Bells Beach yeah. and, as I said, uh, Fairhaven off the Great Ocean Road. Some of the great best surfing in the world is here. You've covered a lot of shows and a lot of variety, and that's really, that to me is amazing. Uh, I've, been, I've been lucky. I have. I'll tell you something else that people ask about, the, the connection, the intersection of, of stunts and acting because I did do uh, stunts for a while, but I uh, and I had an amazing experience doing that. But it wasn't that I set out to do stunts. I was just lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. Kojak, you did some stunts on Kojak. Yeah, what happened was this is way back um, in the late seventies when I was just starting out. One of my first jobs as an actress, I mean, I'd done some soaps and I'd done TV commercials, but one of my first nighttime dramatic roles was as a guest star on Kojak. And the thing was, Kojak that year was shooting in New York. Before the year I did it, it had been always shooting in Los Angeles. But 
the show got so popular and Telly Sabalas was, you know, a household name. And Telly was from, I don't know if he was from New York or Jersey, but he was, you know, somewhere in the New York area. That's where he was from. And he was such a big star at that point, And the show was so successful. He told the producers that he wanted to do a season shooting in his in New York. And, you know, it was Telly Savalas. So they said, sure. So what happened was I got cast in an acting role on the series very early on. One of the first episodes, one of the first couple episodes they shot in New York. And the crew, the cast and the crew were all from Los Angeles, you know, the skeleton cast and crew. Um, so the role I had, the character actually dies. Uh, she gets beat up so bad that she ends up in a coma and dies. But the stunt coordinator for the show was new to New York uh, from L.A. He didn't have a stable of stunt women he used. And he approached me uh, early on and uh, said, look, uh, would you be interested in doing the stunts here? I think it's something you might be interested in. You seem fit, coordinated. I mean, I was young and stupid. And and I had done tumbling in, in school uh, and like gymnastics. Um, so he said, I'll tell you what, if you would... I will teach you. I will give you on the job training. I'll teach you. You'll be padded. The set will look dangerous, but everything will be padded. Uh, stuff will be what, what I hit you with and throw you against. It'll be balsa wood, which, you know, is like, you know, it'll crumble. Um, and I'll give you on the job training and you'll get stunt pay on top of your pay as, as an actress. And I was like, yeah. And and the stunt pay was really good. So I thought it was fun. He taught me. It was like learning choreography, you know, uh, step by step by step, like that um, like that game Twister, where yeah, you put your foot right. there yeah. and there. Um, and we worked really hard on it, rehearsed it a lot. When it came to doing that particular stunt, Apparently, it must have looked really good in the dailies because afterwards he came back to me and he said, the producers loved it. It looked great. You did a wonderful job. Uh, you can't be an actress on the show anymore because, you know, your character died. Uh, but if you are interested in really learning stunts, I will use you to double other actresses when a stunt is called for for the rest of the season in New York. Smart. And it was like, are you kidding me? I mean, it beats waiting tables, right? So I got on the job training, doubling other actresses. And he did have a group of stuntmen that he used that I got to know. And the this is all while I'm still acting. That's but, cool. you know, it was really good pay and really good experience. And I thought it was fun. I mean, I got some black and blue marks and bruises and stuff but i didn't do anything where i really ever felt in mortal danger actually there were a couple of requests for things that i thought nah, nah, nah this is too risky for me i didn't want to run through uh fire and nope um but um i got to know other stuntmen that worked on the show obviously uh with this stunt coordinator and they were stunt coordinators on other shows so i started doing stunts on two or three of the soap operas in in new york that occasionally needed a stunt i remember falling down you know getting pushed falling down a flight of stairs being you know one of the regulars on a on a soap and then one of the stunt coordinators uh that worked on one of the stuntmen who worked on uh, Kojak turned out to be the stunt coordinator for the New York sequences of the feature film Superman 1 and 2. And he approached me and said, would you like to double Margot Kidder in the movie Superman 1 and 2 for the New York sequences? I'm like, yeah, let me think about that for a nanosecond. So I was doubling Margot Kidder. I, I am the stunt double for Margot Kidder 
in Superman, you know, Lois Lane in Superman one and two for the New York sequences. You know, that shot in Europe, I think, you know, uh, London and shot all over the world, uh, the two shows. But anything that was done in New York that called for Margot Kidder or Lois Lane, that's me. So that's amazing. Then I got cast as the series regular in Spider-Man, unrelated to stunts. I was in New York. The sh- Spider-Man was shooting in L.A. They relocated me. It was nice, uh, you know, nice to come to Los Angeles with a series and they paid for the move. And so I started working on I, I showed up here uh, on a Friday and then on a Monday, I was a series regular working nonstop on 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 Spider-Man with Nick Hammond. And from that time forward, no production company would let me do my own stunts because I was, you know, I was doing starring, starring roles and guest starring roles and series regular roles. So they didn't want to risk my getting hurt. It was short and sweet, but it was pretty cool doing the stunts. I can appreciate at least you got the opportunity to do it and you actually did it. And that's like a feather in your cap, an extra feather in your cap. Oh, because I'm saying there's not too many stunt women around. You know what I mean? Even in the 60s, I'm just saying, even for yeah. series like Batman and that, they had to find stunt women in doubles. Right, right. Uh, and I got good training. I, you know, I, I still do some, when I work, I, I don't need a stunt double for most things, but you know, they, they don't like to take too many, those insurance companies don't like to take too many chances with their actors. I want to ask you, Ellen, when did you think that you got your big break in acting? Do you remember that? Your big break, the first one? Well, that would have to be um, getting the series regular role on uh, Spider-Man, which relocated me from New York to L.A. That that really was an incredibly big break. And uh, I know you talked to my friend Tara Buckman, yep. who was uh, a universal contract player. In fact, Tara and I had known each other back in the day and lost touch with each other for decades. But then she was also at this mid-Atlantic nostalgia convention. And coincidentally, our, you know, tables were right next to each other. So for three days, we just were yakking and signing photos and taking pictures and, you know, getting back reappointed. And uh, she was originally, as I think she told you, a universal contract player. Those those seven-year term contracts got phased out right around the late, you know, late 70s, early 80s. When I was in New York, um, I got the the Spider-Man, uh, but I was also offered within the same week, I was offered a, a seven-year contract uh, to go under contract to Universal, which also would have relocated me to Los Angeles. And I marched into my agent's office back in New York and said, oh, my God, I got to do the universal contract. And my agent sat me down and would not let me leave the office until he convinced me, no, you don't want the term contract. You you just booked the, the female lead on a nighttime series on the air. That's what you're doing. You're not doing the term contract, which it does guarantee you a paycheck, but that's about all it guarantees you. I mean, sure, they try to put you to work, but I had a nighttime series that I was uh, the, the, you know, co-lead on, the the female lead. So eventually he kind of browbeat me and made me understand, no, this is what you choose, even though. It was quite an honor to get offered the uh, universal contract as well. I can From- appreciate what you're saying because what he's basically telling you is you're you're already there. You're going to be in people's land room. This is a starring role. Like the Amazing Spider-Man, it's got such a huge following through Marvel. You can see how that 
that character is one of the greatest characters out there. So to have that role, it's something special. It was wonderful. We only wish it would rerun, you know? I know, I don't know if you've ever talked to Nick Hammond. I think I he, yeah, he lives in Sydney um, or outside of Sydney. But it, it, we're also, we're amazed that uh, CBS or whoever owns it now, um, I, I can't remember who has it, you know, it moves around who, you know, they buy different, li the, the, big, uh, the big production companies buy different libraries of, of uh, films and TV shows. But it's amazing to us that it's never rerun. It's never rerun. And neither one of us have ever been asked to do a cameo on in the franchise of <laughs> the feature film. It's like, what? It would seem like a no-brainer, even if it was a little throwaway two-line part. I mean, it would be so inside for people who know the TV series. It would be, whoa, that's cool. Look, that's Nick Hammond. That's Ellen Bree. They were on the TV show. Yeah, but, but I'm just saying, the fact that you're in that time period of like 78, 79, that one, that's what makes it more unique. Because as I said, Spider-Man started taking off big franchises after that. So you're right. like in that original series that actually counts for something. I think so. Well, maybe one of those producers will listen to your podcast. <laughs> oh, I hope they give you a cameo yeah. role. In a film, and what was it like playing on uh, Mission Impossible 3? I was in the makeup trailer with Tom Cruise. He was, you know, he has an entourage around him. Uh, but one of the days that I was on the set, Katie Holmes came on to visit and he made an announcement to the cast and crew that they were getting married. So it was kind of unique. Um, anyway, uh, I played Carrie Russell's mother and her character dies. So uh, the scene I was in or the scenes uh, were at her funeral. And uh, I don't know. You know, I, I was crying a lot. You know, I was supposed to be obviously bereft because my daughter died. Um, With the so. buildup of that sort of movie, and you know it's going to be huge, how, what's the feeling when it gets released? <laughs> it's in the cinema for you. You obviously get to see the movie before it's released. Is that correct? I do remember going to a screening of Mission Impossible, but uh, there was another movie I was in what, where we went to the screening for um, Deep Impact. And I played the White House press secretary and Morgan Freeman was uh, the president and Tia Leone starred in it. Anyway, um, it was fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hoot being in a movie that if you go into a theater, not just the screening, but you go into a theater and it's like, whoa, you're up on the screen. It's, it's trippy. It's kind of out of body. It's cool. Well, no, because you see yourself in huge size. That's what's even more amazing. Yeah, it's wild. And uh, it's, it's interesting, though, as an actor, when you watch yourself, you're very critical, or I should say I am. But I think most actors, it's kind of hard to watch yourself because you're watching every little facial expression and body movement and the tone of your voice. And it, it you don't get into the movie as much because you're constantly critiquing your performance and you know, I'm a perfectionist. A lot of artists are perfectionists. And instead of just enjoying it as entertainment, you look at it critically like, oh, I don't like the I don't like the lighting on that or, oh, that's not my most attractive angle or, you know, and it, it's like this. It's like the monkey, the monkey mind. There's this little voice in your head saying, oh, you could have done that better. Oh, I wish they had shot it that way. So it's it's hard to watch yourself on the big screen, even yeah. even on the, the little screen in the living room, which isn't so little anymore. Sometimes it's hard to watch yourself. I can appreciate that because of the producers, the producers having the power. Ah, uh, that's true. 
even when you give a good performance, you know, it's it's hard sometimes to watch yourself. Just like, you know, when you hear your voice played back on a tape recorder or something, it's like, oh my God, that's what I sound like? Ellen, I just want to thank you so much for the interview today. It's been fascinating. It's been fantastic interviewing you. And I wish you all the success with your uh, your roles coming up. And thank oh, you again. Thank you so much, Plastic EP. You thank rock. You. I love I love the background graphics behind you too. And your very cool sunglasses. Thank you so much.